you can share the word of God with people now and they'll say, yeah, we all know that. Why are you sharing that? You know, you're like, you're not shocked by that. No, it's become so normal. So anyway, so now you guys know who this guy is and, and uh, you'll probably be hearing more from him down the road. But now chapter 14, so we finished looking at Lucifer. That's where we finished last week. And now we take up with him talking about the destruction of Babylon. He'll talk about the destruction of the Philistines and then we'll get into Moab. That may be as far as we get tonight. We'll see depending on time. But first of all, he goes on Isaiah prophesying about Babylon being destroyed. Now remember the setting. Babylon was not a world power at this time. Babylon was just kind of there. They were a country, but they weren't a world power. The Medes were certainly not a world power. They were less significant than Babylon. And Isaiah's been prophesying about how Babylon is going to destroy Israel. And then the Medes are going to destroy Babylon. And everybody's going, what are you talking about? Neither of them are a threat. Well, again, remember, he's speaking prophetically. He's looking to the future. And so now we're talking about a future Babylon that will be a power. And God, after they destroy Israel, God will destroy them. And that's where we take up in verse 22. He says, for I will rise up against them, says the Lord of hosts. Remember, Lord of hosts is always a significant um, a signifier of the Lord of battle. Host means the armies of heaven, the angels of heaven, the Lord of hosts. He says, so the, the Lord of battle will rise up against them and cut, off, cut them off from, or rather cut off from Babylon, the name and remnant so I'm going to wipe them out and their remnant. And offspring and their posterity, says the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the porcupine and marshes of muddy water. I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. So this great Babylon is going to be a place where wild animals are. And that's how it is today. And remember we talked about it could already be fulfilled. This could be speaking of that fulfillment. Some believe there's going to be a resurrection. They really Saudi Arabia is kind of that picture of that, this happening today or whatever. But either way, it literally is. Ancient Babylon is a place of marshes and muddy water and porcupines today. So we see that has happened. Now he goes into Assyria being destroyed. He says, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, surely I have thought... Uh, I have, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass, and as I have purposed, so it shall stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land. Now, at this time, Assyria was attack, attacking Israel. They were getting ready to attack Israel. They were taking the world over. They were the world power. So if you want to know the order of things, Assyria is the world power. God's going to deal with them. Then Babylon comes on the scene, takes Israel captive. After God's done with Babylon, he deals with them. Then the Medes and the Persians come on the scene. God deals with them. Then Alexander the Great comes on the scene deals with them. Then Rome comes on the scene in the days of Jesus. They're gone, and there's going to be a revived Roman Empire in the last days, okay? The second leg to the statue, if you will. Um, and so now we're talking modern day about the Assyrians. So we talked about prophecy jumping all over the place, and that's why you need a timeline, which by the way, I'm working on a timeline for our webpage so you guys can go and kind of see a timeline of major prophetic events that you can get your mind wrapped around it. We've had those before. I may try to put one on our webpage, but uh, now we're back to modern day. Assyria is going to be attacking them. So the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. As I have purposed, so it shall stand. I'll break the Assyrian in my land and on my mountain, tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth. Now, this is interesting. Notice this. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. Some people say, well... The whole earth, here, whole earth is a reference to the whole known earth at that time, which is the Middle East region and Europe and all that, which indeed Assyria did conquer. Some say this may actually be a prophecy of the future of the Antichrist destroying the whole earth because there are those who believe that when it refers to the Assyrian, which it does more than once prophetically, that it's also another term that's used for the Antichrist. Again, I can't nail that down as a positive, but that is a, a possibility there as well. But notice, again, the main thing you need to focus here is that God is saying is going to destroy Assyria and, of course, Babylon. Uh, and then he finishes here saying this, For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? That is, I'm going to do it. You can't stop it. His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? You can't stop God from what God is going to do. And so, indeed, God uh, does this here. And we know historically God did it. Now he goes to the Philistines, which was Israel's arch enemy uh, throughout most of their time there in Israel. Their number one enemy, really. Uh, this is the burden which came in the year that King Ahaz died. Do not rejoice, all you of Philistia, Philistines, because the rod that struck you is broken. For out of the serpent's roots will come forth a viper and its offspring, a fiery flying serpent. The firstborn of the poor will feed and the needy will lie down in safety. And I will kill your roots with famine and will slay your remnant. So what he's saying in essence is, I'm going to wipe you out by the armies I send against you. And not only are they going to wipe you out, they're going to wipe out your roots, the very root system of the Philistines. So I'm taking out, what God is saying is, there will be no more Philistines by the time I'm done, not even, any, not even a root system. Now, he doesn't say that about 
the Babylonians or the Assyrians, there are still some from that region and some from Babylon, Chaldeans that still exist today. The Canaanites, as a matter of fact, we know now from DNA testing and the genetics that we have that Lebanon are Canaanites. So when you see Lebanon that's north of Israel, that's where the Lebanon, the ones that weren't wiped out by the Jews when God sent them in, they fled north and they're up there now. And genetically they can show they are literally Canaanites that still exist today, but they're up there in Lebanon. Not all of them, but a large contingent. And they're there uh, in that place. It's interesting, he says, I will destroy your roots with famine and, and, and even your remnant will be gone. I'll come back to that. Let me go ahead and finish the destruction here. Verse 31, well, O gate, cry, O city, all of you of Philistia or the Philistines are dissolved for smoke will come from the north. That's where the battle's gonna come from to wipe them out. And no one will be alone at his appointed times. Both Assyria and Babylon came from the north. What will they answer the messengers of the nation? In other words, why did this happen? Well, Here's what, here's why the Lord did it. The Lord founded Zion, not the Philistines, that the Lord has founded Zion and the poor of his people shall take refuge in it. So what he's saying is you're gonna be wiped out and although my people Israel are gonna be judged, Zion's gonna be protected. That is the nation of Israel, I'm gonna protect them. And of course we know in other places in scripture, God says in the last days, I'll bring the Jews back into their land. We know that prophetically began in 1948. As remember the end of World War II, uh, God moved in the leaders of the nations to realize, hey, the Jews just had six million of them killed. They have no homeland of their own for 2,000 years. Let's give them a homeland. And of course, the UN said, all right, you can have a homeland. And uh, David Ben-Gurion stood up there in Israel. And I went and saw that little room that he stood up in. When you watch the video of it, I got to go to Tel Aviv and just go and look at that little room. And kind of, it's a tiny little room, but how exciting it was to be there and see that table. They've left it set up so you can see what it was like. And uh, in my brain, seeing the old reels of it happening and then looking and seeing where they were sitting. And I kind how to play that video out in my mind. Israel was born right there in that room again. God just said, now you're a nation. David Ben-Gurion stood up and said, we are now a nation. And if you know the history of it, there were like five different Arab nations that came attacking them from all sides. Everyone said, Israel will be wiped out. There's no way they can fight against these established Arab armies all around them. And had it not been for God, they would not have been able to. But God supernaturally probably sent Michael because the Bible says that Michael is the defender of Israel. And uh, five Arab armies may have been quite formidable against a few Jews who hadn't even had time to really develop a military or an army, but against Michael, they don't have a chance. Uh, one angel wiped out 185,000 Assyrians in one night on the Mount of Olives when Sennacherib came against Hezekiah. So I'm sure Michael just showed up and said, nope, not on my watch. And the Lord said, this is not gonna happen. So Israel defeated five Arab armies on all sides. And they not only defeated them, they ended up having a little bit more land than they had. And every time they've been attacked now by their enemies, God's given them a little bit more land. You know, people talk about land that Israel's taking. They've never taken any land. They were given land by the world, really by God. And they've been attacked by their enemies and they continue to get more land the more they're attacked. And so it's interesting to watch how God works. Um, you know, I, 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 it's just the miracles. We could talk about just the battles of Israel and, and just get into that, quite amazing. Now, that brings us to the point of God says, I'll establish Zion, but the Philistines will disappear. Now, you may not know this, but I want to give you a little bit more history. And so tonight, we're not going to cover as much territory. These few weeks are kind of, you know, we're slowing down some because there's so much good stuff. And we'll speed up later um, in our overview of the Bible. This is supposed to be the overview of the Bible, but sometimes I can't help myself. And it's, it's, too, it's, too, it's too juicy um, to see what God has done for the nation of Israel and just talk about it. Um, God loves the Palestinians. It's nothing against the Palestinian people. God loves the Jews. What is the history of the Palestinians? Well, many people don't realize this, but there's never been a Palestinian nation in, in, in existence in the world ever. That shocks some people. What? There's never been? No, there never has. This, it's this, when, they, when they talk about trying to establish a Palestinian nation or a, Philistine, a, a Palestinian nation, uh, people go, yeah, they're you know, trying to reestablish or whatever. There's, there's never been one. So where did that phraseology come from? They used to call the Jews Palestinians. As a matter of fact, in 48, the Jews were known as Palestinians as well. So where did the terminology come from and why the confusion? Well, Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian in the 100s hated the Jews so much that he said, I'm gonna pick your arch enemy, the one that you hate the most, and I'm gonna name your land after them. Now, by this time, God had prophesied there would be no more Philistines on the earth. The Philistines had been wiped out. By the way, Philistine is the word Palestine. That's where it comes from. It's just a modern word, Philistine. So when you're a Palestine, you're hearing Philistine, okay? So when you're Palestinians, you're hearing really what they're saying is the Philistinians, 
when you watch the news, talking about the Philistinians and Philistine or whatever. So Hadrian knew that. Well, God said, I'm going to wipe your remnant out. They were long wiped out before this ever happened, okay? The, the, the Philistines get wiped out here. God prophesied it. They have been wiped out. Matter of fact, they have now done genetic testing of the whole region. And guess what they can't find anywhere on the planet? A Philistine. They found Canaanites. They found all the other peoples. Um, but they can't find any Philistines. Why? Because God said, you won't. He said, I'm going to take them out. And right here's where you're reading it. God said in chapter 14 of Isaiah, you're not going to find any Philistines, Philistines or Palestinians, no matter how much genetics you develop, they, they don't exist. Well, Hadrian says, so I'm going to name this whole region because you hate the Philistines and you hated them. They've been your enemies because I hate you so much. I'm going to call this Philistine or Palestine. So the, that region became known as Palestine because it was renamed by Emperor Hadrian when Rome ruled the world during that time. Well, all the years went by, and of course, because that region was called that, the name stuck. And the people that lived there became known as Philistinians or Philistines, none of which they were. They're all either of Arab descent or Jewish descent or Moab, Edom, Ammonites. We'll talk about them tonight, too. So if you do their genetics, you'll find there are no Philistines. There are all these different ways. So if you were to ask someone today who's a Palestinian, and maybe they're trying to fight against, you know, saying they, they, the land belongs to them, whatever, um, do you, are you a Philistine? They'll, they'll tell you, well, no, I'm not a Philistine. Well, then why do you call yourself a Palestinian? If they know the history, they'll tell you. It's actually just used now politically. It's a political word that's used to somehow say the Jews don't belong here. This land was really Palestinian. It's been Palestinian for thousands of years. And so now the Jews have come in and taken over. No, it was never Philistinian. The Philistines never had that land. It was pretty much after God judged the, uh, Israel and took them out, Rome took it over, and it was intermingled with a lot of peoples that lived in a region that Hadrian renamed Philistine or Philistine or Palestine. And so that's its history. That's all there is. So there's never been a, a Palestinian coin or money. There's never been a Palestinian nation. It's never existed ever. As a matter of fact, you may be shocked to find out Jordan didn't exist until 1948. That's when it began. There was a region there, obviously, but it wasn't called Jordan. Um, Syria, all these were just, after World War II, they broke the land up in different areas, drew lines, and said, here's these new nations, and they created them, okay? But God, in his word, just looks at the ancient territory and says, this is the land of Israel. This is where Mo, uh, you know, Ammon, Moab, and, and the Edomites are, and, and you still have the ancient peoples connected to those regions, but don't let what they call it in the modern names stumble you to what's going on historically or prophetically or biblically, all right? Uh, but it's interesting, too, when you hear the term West Bank, a lot of people think that has to do with, with the Philistines or Philistinia or Palestine. It doesn't at all. That has to do with modern-day Jordan. Jordan, again, has uh, had control of that region. When they broke it up in, in, in 1948, they were giving them that region, and through all the battles, Israel's taken it. So it's not the West Bank of what it should be Palestinian territory or whatever. It's basically the West, they call it the West Bank of Jordan, which Jordan didn't exist until 1948. Okay, is everybody following me now? Okay, so... Understand the terminology that the media uses, that the world uses, is totally wrong. And you've got to know the Bible and you've got to know history to really understand what's going on. So, um, again, God now talks about how this is going to be broken up in different things. He's going to judge these different nations. He's now dealt with the Philistines or what they're called, you know, what, again, uh, Palestine, if you will. But it's interesting. And I know it's not the original Philistines because they're gone. But here's what God at there at the end of chapter 14 told the Philistines. He said, no, not only am I going to wipe you out, I'm going to give this land to Zion. And so it's kind of almost this kind of, um, I don't know, maybe poetic, strange poetic justice to see today that Zion, the nation of Israel, is in what many have called the land of Palestine or the Philistines, and the Philistines don't even exist, but Israel's there. So even though it's not the same people group, it's kind of, um, I don't know, it's almost kind of like a, a, a little something God's done there that kind of like, you know, yeah, look, I said Israel's gonna be there, it's theirs, and they're gonna be there. By the way, when God comes back, when the Lord comes back and rules for a thousand years, Israel owns only a tiny swath of what God gave them and what God's going to give them. They're gonna own all the way down to the border of Egypt, so all of Sinai will be there. We look at the boundaries of what God has said, and they're going to own all the way over to the Euphrates, which is Iraq and Iran. That will be Israel during the thousand-year reign. And God gave them that land, but they've never taken it. The most they ever took was in the reign of David. And God said, if you disobey me and you're disobedient to me, then you're, going, you're not going to have all the land. But he said, if you're obedient, I'll give it. Well, today they're disobedient. So God said, I'm going to keep a remnant. I'll give you a little swat right there. And I've never done the land mass calculations, but if we have any of you land mass guys, I don't know if that'd be geology, I don't know what that would be. If you know how to calculate that, let me know, because I have a theory, and I'll publicly admit my theory was wrong when you prove me wrong. 
I think, you know, God says, I'm going to preserve a remnant. And you see all through scripture, the principle of the tithe. You know, you give me 10%. And I wonder if that little swath of land is about 10% of the land God has given Israel. And so God is saying, I'm going to be faithful. I'll keep a tithe of you. I'll be a tithe of the Jews and a tithe of land. When I bring you back, nobody will take you out. God said, when I bring Israel back in the land, nobody's going to defeat them. That's why Israel has won war after war after war. They're tiny. They're the size of New Jersey. I mean, jokingly, we said you, you, you could carpet Israel almost, you know. And yet the whole world's against them saying, you have too much land. It's like, look, all of God's like, it's like a one bedroom, you know. On a, you know. <laughs> You've got the entire city and you want me, they're surrounded by over 500 million Arabs and they're saying, they have too much land. I'm like, I don't, I, I don't know what you're seeing and what I'm missing. But again, it's political, it's spiritual, it's uh, ancient, uh, it's Hagar and um, Ishmael and, and Abraham and, and Isaac. And remember God said, you know, um, I've given the land to Isaac and we saw that Sarah said, Lord, I'm going to help you out because we're not having any kids here. And so uh, Abraham, won't you take Hagar, my handmaiden, and have a child with them. And so Ishmael was born. And Ishmael, from the, the descendants of Ishmael are the original and actual Arabs. If you hear the term Arab, not everybody in the Middle East that's non-Jew is an Arab, okay? They're all different backgrounds. But the real Arabs are the real descendants of Ishmael, and they're mostly centered in Saudi Arabia. So if you want to know the more, the more pure Ishmaelites, it would be Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and it's interesting today to see that God says in the last days, Saudi Arabia will not be really aggressively against Israel. They're actually kind of making friends now. Saudi Arabia is actually taking up for Israel now. And you wonder, why in the world is this Arab nation taking up for Israel when everybody hates Israel so much? They're family. They're family, and they know it. They may not like each other. They're brothers that fought growing up. And they're still fighting today. By the way, any of you Sarahs out there or Abrahams who think my little sin's not gonna affect anybody, Abraham and Sarah affected the entire world and they're still affected from their one sin. The things you see going on in the Middle East, Abraham and Sarah. Let's help God out. I say let's wait on God. Let's not help God out. Uh, it causes national wars for thousands of years in some cases, um, like it did here. So either way, um, so that's kind of the, the layout. And you see now, I, what I think is sweet, when Abraham died, um, Ishmael and Isaac, they split because they had this big fight going on. They didn't like each other, right? And they separated. They, they, there wasn't a lot of communication. It's like this kind of bad family event that happened and we're not gonna talk, you know, probably not even except maybe Thanksgiving and Christmas, but even then we won't say much. We'll show up and we'll get our plate and we're leaving, right? But when Abraham died, guess who both came to the service? Ishmael and Isaac. It says they both showed up to show honor to their dad. And there's been this ancient connection that's there. And I think today what you're seeing is there's this ancient connection between Saudi Arabia, the descendants of Ishmael, between Israel, and they're still connected. And so there's this like, yeah, we, we don't like each other and you know we have different everything or whatever the case might be, but we don't want to kill you. You know, we may not, you know, be golfing buddies, you know, but we're not going to kill you. So it's interesting to watch this unfold. And you're going to see now as we get into chapter 15, there's also another unfolding of a region that's all connected. Tonight's kind of history night. And so we may not get more than 15. We may get 15 and 16. We'll see. But let's go ahead and, and first of all, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. Pop that slide up there. I have some visuals for you, class, because I like visuals. Ammon, Moab, and Edom, they are directly across from Israel, ancient. These are now, again, that today is Jordan. Okay, but it was renamed in 48 to Jordan. Before that, it was just that region. It was anciently in the biblically known as Ammon, Moab, and Edom. You can remember this now from top to bottom. It spells Amy. A-M-E. Now, it's not really Amy, but you're with me, right? This is the kind of thing that helps me. When you read the Bible, where's Ammon? Where's Moab? Where's Edom? Now you'll never forget that. You see that picture in your mind? You're going to know from now on, it's Amy. Oh, yeah, Ammon's up there at the top part of Israel on the other side. Moab's in the middle on the other side, and Edom's down at the bottom on the other side. Isn't that great? I'll try to share some of those with you if I can. Um, go eat popcorn's another one. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You know, you're trying to find them. You know, it's like. So now there's a couple for you. Go eat popcorn and eat popcorn with Amy. All right. 
Now, why am I showing you this? Because I want you to see as we get into this, we're going to be talking about Ammon, Moab, and Eden. Let me give you a history lesson, a little bit about these guys, okay? These are also distant family members of Israel. We're going to see in the last days that Jordan, which encompasses Amy, Jordan is going to allow the Jews to flee down to Petra. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 24. Why would they do that? Family. There's a fa- Although these people are fighting, there's still family connections. It's like there's still this connection that God's going to say, look, you're family. You need to honor this. And we're going to see God call them to account tonight saying, you have to honor them. You need to hide the outcast. You need to let them come in there, etc." But now where did Ammon and Moab come from? Remember when Lot was pulled out of Sodom and Gomorrah by the angels? And then the angels sent fire. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his family fled down to Zoar. Remember? Another, he said, can I go to some near town by? They didn't want to just go to the mountains. They wanted to go somewhere where there was civilization. So they went down to Zoar. And then when they saw Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed, they panicked. So what if God destroys Zoar? So then they decided to move up into the caves above Zoar. And they stayed up there, and God didn't destroy Zoar, but they were afraid he would. So there sits Lot and his two daughters. Well, the two daughters are going, how are we going to pass on our family name, all our entire community that we know, our entire people got wiped out. And in, in their mindset, for wherever they were, they decided to get dad drunk and to sleep with him and get pregnant, incest. Because they said, there's no way we're going to be able to ca- carry on the family line. So one gets, they get dad drunk one night, one of the daughters sleeps with him. From those descendants come the Ammonites. Then the second daughter sleeps with dad the second night, gets him drunk, the Moabites. So the Ammonites and Moabites come from an ancestral relationship with Lot out of Zoar after God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So although it's a distant relationship, Lot was the nephew of Abraham. So you see now descendants of Lot being a nephew of Abraham, distantly connected to Abraham and connected now to Israel, which is why when the Jews tried to come into the land and the Moabites wouldn't let them come in and everybody's fighting against them when God was giving them the land of Canaan, remember? When they came in, they wouldn't let Israel come through and Israel had to travel all the way around. God said, that's your family. Because you're rejecting your family, I'm gonna judge you for that. You're turning against your own brother, your own, your own sister. You're, you're in rebellion. So God deals with them, okay? Now, the Edomites descendants of Esau. Jacob and Esau. Remember Esau? God said, I'm going to put the bloodline through Jacob. The Messiah is going to come. That's where my promise is going to be. But the Edomites are going to be, you know, red. Um, And that whole region down there, the bottom area, that's where um, Esau's descendants went down there. And Esau means red. That whole region of Edom, which became the region they called that, is now a totally red region. And down in the area, Moab and Ammon, right in between those two words down there, that's where, or down really toward the Edom area, that's where um, Petra is. So you're going to see this bleed over of the land of Moab and the land of Edom and Petra and God talking about this thing. We're going to leave that slide up there all through chapter 15, okay? Um, And so let's jump into this. Now you know, oh, some more history about Moab before we get in. Moab was also connected to Israel because David was one-fourth Moabite. Remember the little cutie Ruth that came up with Naomi? And she goes up with Boab. She puts on a little bit of midnight in Moab, you know? She goes and uncovers his feet. You know, and he wakes up, and oh, and she's beautiful. And so they end up getting married. That's a Moabite connection. So then David... When his parents were threatened because Saul was chasing him all over that region down in there on the other side of the Dead Sea or down at the Dead Sea that says, uh, actually up there where you see Hebron and Dead Sea, David's running that whole region, running from Saul. During that time, he said, I'm afraid he's going to kill mom and dad, so I'm going to send mom and dad over to Moab. So when you read that now, you'll see he sent him over to Moab. Why would he send him over to Moab? The family connection to Ruth, his great-great-grandmother, okay? So he was one-fourth Moabite, David was and yet still fully Jew because he had 75%, but he was one-fourth Moabite. So that's a connection. Um, And make sure there's no other connections you need to know before we do this. I think that's good enough. Ruth, David, David's parents. um, And so they stayed down there. So you see the family connections. I think that's good enough now jumping into chapter 15. So the burden against Moab. Because in the night of Ar, Moab is laid waste and destroyed. Because in the night, Kir of Moab is laid waste and destroyed. He's talking about the judgment. He has gone up to the temple of Dibon to the high places to weep. Moab will, again, why is he weeping? Because God's going to judge them. This is not good for Dibon. This is bad to Dibon. (laughs) Moab will well over Nebo and over Mediba. 
On all their heads will be baldness. On every beard will be cut off. In the morning of judgment, you would cut off your hair and cut your beard. That's what the men would do. So he's showing their mourning, their weeping. In the streets, they will clothe themselves with sackcloth on the tops of their houses. And in their streets, everyone will wail, weeping bitterly. Heshbon and Elah will cry out. Their voice shall be heard as far as Jahaz. Therefore, the armed soldiers of Moab will cry out. His life will be burdensome to him. So even the military guys, their life will be burdensome because they realize they've got to go to battle and they're going to be getting wiped out and defeated by the armies. Nobody wants to go into battle knowing you're going to get killed. I mean, you, you go into battle thinking you might get killed, but to go into battle knowing you're going to get killed and everybody's going to die, that's not a fun thing. And so that's what he's describing here. The judgment's going to come against them. And notice God's heart. This is what I love. You read this, but now you know the history. You know the connection to Ruth and the love that God had for Ruth and the connection to David and the connection to the family and all that happened with Moab. And look what God says. Either God or Isaiah, you can argue, but God is speaking through Isaiah. So I, but he says, my heart will cry out for Moab. Even though Moab was their enemy, even though Moab was attacking them, even though Moab hated Israel and, and, and wrongfully and spitefully dealt with them, he says, I weep over them. Why? Because they're family. It's David's great-great-grandmother. This is David, this is the, they're connected. Why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you fighting with your own family, Moab? You're turning on your own people. Why would you do that? I weep for you. My heart's broken, God would say. His fugitives, notice this, shall flee to Zoar. That's where they were born. Remember Ammon and Moab, the two daughters, or the two descendants of the daughters? That wasn't the daughter's name, but their descendants were Ammon and Moab. He said, they, your fugitives are going to flee to where your birthing place was with, with Lot, that whole thing where they were born as nations. Like a three-year-old heifer, for by the ascent of Luhith, they will go up with weeping. For in the way of Hor, uh, Horonaim, they will raise up a cry of destruction. For the waters of Nimrim will be desolate. Again, these are regions we don't know in that area. But again, we, and we're not going to take the time to look at them. But he's speaking of those regions there in Moab and in Edom. For the green grass has withered away. The grass fails. There's nothing green. Therefore, the abundance they have gained and what they have laid up, they will carry away to the brook of willows. So they're going to be wiped out and all their green trees cut down. Everything's going to be gone when the battle's done. For the cry has gone all around the borders of Moab. It's wailing to Eglaim and it's wailing to Be'er Elim. The waters of Demon will be full of blood. Because I will bring more upon Demon, lions upon him who escapes from Moab on the rim, uh, and on the remnant of the land. He's not going to totally wipe out the Moabites. He's going to tell later there'll be a remnant in the last days. But he's saying here, even when you flee, if you get away from the army, I'm going to have wild animals kill you. That's how, that's how serious your judgment's going to be because of your, of your rebellion against God and all your false gods and all that you're doing. And notice he says in verse 9, the waters of Demon will be full of blood. You know, ancient battles, you read about these, and even current battles, you read about them. It's amazing how much blood... Not to be too graphic, but comes from people in battle. It, 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 again, it was said that during when Roman siege of Israel, when they were attacking Israel and wiping them out, that they have all concrete, you know, all these rocks. Jerusalem is rather the concrete of Jerusalem. I mean, it's all rock. Everything there is stone. And so the blood has nowhere to go other than running down the streets like, water, like a waterfall and gutters or whatever. And they said the blood was running so much it would go in people's homes and put out their fires where their house was burning, you know, or, or, or fire they had for their food, or they'd go in their house and put fires out. The blood was running so much as, as the siege came. So when he says the waters were turned to blood, you get an idea in how this, the enormous amount of blood from this battle. And then chapter 16, which I was glad we're going to get to tonight. That'll probably be it tonight, but I'm glad we're going to get to it because it's so good. It all ties together here. He says, now to Moab, send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness to the mount of the daughter of Zion. What in the world's going on? Well, Selah is Petra. It's one of the high points of the city of Petra. It's called Selah. So he's speaking about Petra here, the ancient city of Petra. And he says, send the lamb to the ruler of the land. What they would do in that day is when you took over a territory as a tribute, you would tax them in animals oftentimes whether it be money, whether it be animals. And throughout Israel's history, they, for example, would tax that region of Petra and you would send them your payment, your tribute would be a bunch of sheep or a bunch of oxen or maybe it'd be money or whatever the tax was. And there was a time they were taxing them in sheep and taxing them in lambs. Here's the point he's making. Look, he's about to say, some of you Moabites are gonna flee to Jerusalem. And so I'm, I want you to flee there because I'm gonna save a remnant of you guys when, when, when you know, Babylon comes in to wipe you out. I'm gonna send a remnant, when, and when Assyria, rather, comes in to wipe the region out, I'm gonna send a remnant up to Jerusalem and I'm gonna protect Jerusalem. And that's when Sennacherib came against Jerusalem and protected Hezekiah. He let the Moabites, some of the Moabites fled there and the Jews took them in and protected them. And why would the Jews do that? Because they were descendants of 
Ruth and David, and there was a connection to the family of Lot to Abraham and all that went with that. So because of the connection, they allowed the Moabites that fled there to come in. They may not have been friends, but they're like, okay, where it's wartime, you are a distant family, come on in. And, and so Israel took them in. So what he's saying here to the nation before this battle takes place where Assyria wipes out what we're reading about here and wipes out the Moabites, he's saying, send Israel your tribute. Don't withhold a tribute. Give them a gift. Stay on their good side. Give them a gift of lambs. Give them whatever you want to give them because you need to keep that friendship because soon you're going to be fleeing up there and they're going to take you in. So keep the relationship good. It may not be the best, but at least don't offend them because I'm going to send you to the, to the Mount of the Daughter of Zion because I'm going to protect again, the, uh, the Jerusalem from the attack of the Assyrian when Hezekiah was there. He says, for Moab, for it, that is Moab, shall be as a wandering bird thrown out of the nest. So shall the daughters of Moab at the forge of Arnon. So this first couple of verses, he's talking about um, Moab, but there's also a very interesting, I think, dual prophecy very possibly going on here because in the next verses, he's gonna talk about Petra, and the Jews fleeing to Petra that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 24 when he says to flee to the mountains from Jerusalem when the Antichrist declares that he's God. I'll explain that more in a moment. But there's also maybe an intimation here in these first couple of verses about the, uh, the sheep or the lambs coming from Petra being all the Jews that are protected down there now being sent back up with the Messiah or to meet the Messiah when Jesus comes in the second coming. But look what happens here in verse three. He now goes, the first couple of verses are directly to Moab in its immediate, direct, ancient context. And then verse three, take counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day and hide the outcast. What in the world is he talking about? Again, he's gonna reveal this. Notice this, do not betray him who, who escapes. Let my outcast dwell with you, O Moab. He's talking about the Jews that are fleeing. And again, Jesus revealed the Jews would be fleeing when the Antichrist uh, makes his declaration or whatever. He says, be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler. He's talking about the Antichrist. When the Antichrist tries to wipe them out, when he declares that he's God, and I'll walk you through this in just a moment, he said, protect them for the extortioner is at an end. Devastation ceases because God's gonna deal with the Antichrist. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. And notice this, in mercy, the throne will be established. What throne? Jesus on his throne for a thousand years, and one will sit on it in truth, that is Jesus, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. Now again, this will be the fourth temple he'll be in. Uh, a lot of people don't even know there's gonna be a fourth temple. The first three temples, the third temple is gonna be built by the Antichrist. The Bible says the Lord will destroy that when he comes back, and then Ezekiel talks about the fourth temple that has not been defiled by the Antichrist, that's the one Jesus will be ruling and reigning in and it's talking about right here in Moab. So let's, now let's talk this through about how this is gonna happen in a lot of this scripture, okay? The rapture is gonna take place. God says, I'm gonna deal with the nation of Israel seven more years because God promised them a full 70 weeks of years. He's only given them 69. We know that ended when Jesus died. Daniel talks about it in Daniel chapter nine. You'll have to wait till we get to Daniel. We're gonna do that on Sunday morning right after we're done with Matthew. And we'll talk about that more in detail because I know that I went a million miles an hour on Passover day and, and actually on, on uh, Palm Sunday. And so probably nobody got much of any of that, but we'll slow down and talk about it and really give you timelines and we'll lay it out for you very clearly. But the, the rapture will take place. The seven years will begin. The Antichrist will show up. The whole world will love him. He'll seem to have the answers. Everybody will take the mark at some point. We don't know if it'd be at the beginning, at the midpoint, I'm not sure on that. But at the midway point, three and a half point, the Antichrist will stand up and tells us in Revelation and say, no, no, guess what? I'm God. So you're gonna bow down to me and everybody's gonna go, whoa. And the Jews are gonna realize at that moment, oh my goodness, we've been duped. This is not our Messiah. Our Messiah would never say that he's God and we have to bow down to him because they didn't believe their Messiah was gonna be God. There's gonna be a lot of understanding they don't have and do have when all that happens. But they're gonna know this guy's a phony because they're gonna, they're gonna know he's not God. And they're gonna flee. And that's where Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, that is when the Antichrist stands up and says that he's God. It's an abomination on the Temple Mount. He said, then flee to the mountains. Now we go, what mountains? Well, now he tells us right here in Isaiah 6, uh, chapter 16. Petra, you're gonna be fleeing. And he tells, he tells Moab and Edom. He tells this region. He tells Selah. He tells Petra, hide my outcasts. It'll be like a shadow in the middle of the day. It's like they're gonna be traveling in the daylight. You hide them, you take them in. Hey, they took you in when the Assyrians were attacking. 
which we're reading about now. We know historically that happened. So now later on, I'm gonna send them down to you and their family, don't reject them. You take them in, you hide them. And by the way, this is where God's gonna be hiding them. So let's look at the next slide for the class. This is Petra. No, it's, that's not Petra. I mean, you know, it's bigger than that. But that's one building in a giant area called Petra. Here's show another picture. There's all kinds, in Petra, there's all these, they've dug back into the rock, all these buildings, and there's caves everywhere. Um, it's, it's massive. A place could easily handle uh, the Jews down there. The Bible says they'll go down there, and God, during the Great Tribulation, will supernaturally protect the Jews that believe the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 and flee down there. He'll protect them for that final three and a half years. And you say, now, why would the Jews know what Jesus even said? Guys, the tour guides know the New Testament a lot better than many of us in this room, in Israel today, today, and they're unsaved. Why do they know it? They have to know it because of all the Christian groups that God's been sending over there for the last 60, 70 years. So they know about what Jesus said. They know about the prophecy down the Petra. They know all this, even though they're unbelievers. When their eyes are opened and they realize, oh my goodness, there's a guy declaring he's God at our third temple, and Jesus said, flee down to Petra, they're gonna go in masses and head off down that direction. And the Bible says as they're heading down there, the, the Antichrist is going to send his armies chasing him down toward Petra and that the earth's going to open up and swallow them up by flood. They're going to be taken away by a flood. I wonder what it's going to be like. You know, I don't know. Could it be some of those? They have these massive water floods that happen down there near the Dead Sea in that region even today. They have these massive rain stores up in Hebron and in Bethlehem, and it's all rock, just like the blood we talked about. It's all rock. The water runs down that rock and massive sweeps the flood. People drown every year up there and takes buses and cars away, all kinds of stuff. Could God send one of those? Possibly. We don't know. But the army that Antichrist sends is going to be wiped out. God's going to not let them catch the Jews. The Jews will go into uh, Moab and Edom, the ancient region there. They'll go down to Petra, and God's going to supernaturally protect them. Now, this is cool. You guys need to breathe ever so often. You're killing me. Christian groups have been planting food in Petra for years. They've got it hidden. And the government knows it's there and doesn't mind it. They're like, you know, if we ever need that, okay. And so if you go as a tourist, you're not going to find caves with food in it. But they've left messages of where they've hidden all this food so that the Jews can find it. And the government will know about it of Jordan. They can tell them, and they're going to allow them to come in. And they've stored up massive amounts of this kind of, you know, food that lasts forever, you know, this kind of stuff, like a lot of you guys have in your garage right now. <laughs> they've got a lot of that down there in Petra. And they've been gathering it up for years, and it's in a dry environment where it lasts forever and ever and ever. And so they're going to have plenty of food. Not that they need that, but there's even an ancient water system carved into the rock where when it rains, the water will run down through the sea and down through different areas, you know, and just floods it with water so they have fresh water. It's, it's a place because of fresh water where wild animals come on a regular basis. So while they're in there, all the animals are looking for water. The animals come looking for water, and, you know, it's deer tonight, deer, you know. And so they, they just, and God's going to provide everything they need for three and a half years. He'll supernaturally protect them. And when you read Isaiah 63, which we'll get to in about eight years at this point, <laughs> we're going to see that the Lord, before he goes and establishes his throne in Jerusalem, he's going to go down to Petra first. He'll tell us that. You can go read that on your own later on, Isaiah 63. It talks about Basra. Basra is the same as Petra. Okay, same word, Petra, Basra, same area right there. He's going to come down and he's gonna, it says he's going to stomp on, the, on, on, on someone down there in Petra before he comes back up to Jerusalem to establish his throne. And what it's going to be, the armies of the Antichrist are going to surround Petra as they're getting ready for Armageddon all up and down that stretch. They're going to be from all the way down in Petra all the way up to the Valley of Armageddon. There's going to be all the Antichrist armies. They're going to try to take the Jews out at the last minute and the Lord's going to come down and personally, we're not going to get to do that with him on his own. It says he's going to just wipe them out. And that's why when you read about Jesus coming back with blood on his robes, he first goes down to Basra slash Petra, wipes out the Antichrist armies that are trying to hurt the Jews that are hiding and being protected in there. And then he's going to go back and establish his throne in Jerusalem. So that's why he has blood on his robes when we come back with him on white horses. We will join up with him at some point in there. Maybe we're there just watching him do all that. And then he'll come back with us and we'll all go to Jerusalem. I'm not sure how it's going to work. Uh, but either way, it'll be that whole, you know, uh, Israel Petra tour together as we you know the greatest tour we could ever have with Jesus as our tour guide. And, and then he's going to establish his, his kingdom for a thousand years. So 
He says, hide the outcast. Do not betray him who escapes. That is, if they're running from the Antichrist. Let, verse 4, let, not, let my outcast dwell with you, O Moab. Be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler. Um, again, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm reading all that again. I know I have, but let's just jump on down to verse 6. He says, we have heard of the pride of Moab. He's very proud of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Therefore, Moab shall well for Moab. It's not just God weeping for them. So you're going to be crying for yourself when you see the destruction I bring on you. Moab will well for Moab. Everyone shall well. For the foundations of Kur, Hereseth, you shall mourn. Surely they are stricken. For the fields of Heshbon languish and the vine of Sibma, these are again all regions there. The lords of the nations have broken down his choice plants, which have reached to Jezer and wandered through the wilderness. Her branches are stretched out, they are gone over the sea. Therefore I will bewail the vine of Sibma with the weeping of Jezer. I will drench you with my tears, O Heshbon and Eliah, for battle cries have fallen over your summer fruits and your harvests. Gladness is taken away and joy from the plentiful field. In the vineyards there shall be no singing, nor shall there be shouting. No treaders will tread out wine in the presses. I've made their shouting cease. Now they would do that. When they would tread out wine, they would sing songs. They'd do it, you know, get a rhythm going. Or they'd shout, you know, oh, well, whatever, you know. And so he says, no, there's not going to be any joy when they're preparing their wine because um, they're going to be in judgment. Therefore, again, look at this. You look at God's heart here. God and Isaiah, and God speaking through Isaiah. Therefore, my heart shall resound like a harp for Moab. And my inner being for Kir Harris is like, I don't enjoy this. I weep for you. God, look, God never enjoys judgment. The Bible says God desires that none perish. His heart is that everyone survive, that everyone repents, that everyone is saved. That's the heart of God. He doesn't enjoy that. But judgment has to be carried out, or God is not just. But now you see the weeping heart of God. It's like, I have to do this. You know, the old's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. For God, it, it couldn't be more true. And he's weeping. It shall come to pass when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, that is all their false gods, they're weary of worshiping them because they would worship on the high places, that he'll come to his sanctuary to pray, but he will not prevail. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now the Lord has spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of a hired man, the glory of Moab will be despised with all the great multitude, and the remnant will be very small and feeble. So this judgment that I just pronounced, God says, will happen within three years. And, of course, you see it's talking about an immediate fulfillment and a far fulfillment. So dual prophecy now and down in the future. So, um, yeah, well, you know, two and a half chapters. They were short chapters, but... Uh, we won't, we'll try to, like I said, I always say this. I think we really will speed up next week. So read the next four chapters or so, 17, 18, 19, 20. Uh, that way you're kind of ahead. We'll see if we can get that, that far or whatever. Read them. You might even read five just for good measure. And that way you're prepared and ready to go when we jump into it next week. But um, a lot to digest. I realize that. Um, but go back, listen to it over and over. We'll cover it as it comes up. I think I've given you some visuals. That'll help. Does that help a little bit to have the visuals? It does me, I can tell you that. So I have to believe it's going to help you some. These kind of things stick in your brain. And so we'll trust God to do the rest with his word in our hearts. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. We thank you again for just showing us so many things prophetically. And now we can look back and see everything you said has come to pass, which gives us great confidence that everything you said will come to pass. We trust you, Lord. We thank you for your word. I thank you for what you've shown us tonight in your word. And I thank you for what you've done in our hearts individually, not just speaking to us about prophecy and all the things that are going to happen in the last days. But Lord, um, speaking to us individually, prophetically to our own heart. And I thank you for that, God. Your word is alive and breathing and sharper than any two-edged sword as we talked about. And we thank you for how you've used your heart to pierce our hearts tonight. And Lord, let your word now do what you sent it to do. Even as you say in Isaiah 55, even as the, uh, the rain comes down and waters the land and the seed, Lord, grows and it does what it's intended to do, God, sow your word when it's planted and watered with prayer and watered with sunshine from heaven. It produces a crop, fruit, field, joy, harvest. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We bless you and pray you do with your word tonight.